And speaking of selfhood, um, one of the levers we seem to have that most directly affects it is the serotonergic psychedelics that we're seeing a, a kind of renaissance in their, their therapeutic use. And I, I saw earlier this month that you'd uh, called on the UK government to reschedule psilocybin to make it uh, easier to do to do research with. And you also have this uh, fascinating paper with Robin Carter Harris um, on a theory of psychedelic action called Relaxed Beliefs Under Psychedelics or Rebus. Um, would you be able to just briefly explain, before we run out of time, how that fits with what the picture is there of how they act in the brain and how it fits with the free energy principle? Yes, of course. And I'm mindful you said briefly, so I'll try making it. So it actually um, d- directly follows on, uh, on from this notion of attention, sort of um, greasing certain pathways, affording more predictability and therefore more weight to certain messages or prediction errors or free energy gradients that you think convey important information. So if you imagine a hierarchical generative model with multiple levels of abstraction, so the simplest, most elemental explanations um, uh, live very near the, sen- you know, the sensory level of a hierarchical model, the sensory interface, the Markov blanket, but you can have a very deep model, usually cast as a sort of um, centrifugal architecture, so stuff in the centre, usually hypotheses, narratives that last a long period of time, but much more abstract. The degree to which they are informed by or provide top-down constraints on the Bayesian beliefs held at different levels of the hierarchy, so the more peripheral towards the sensory uh, level, depends very sensitively on the precision that you estimate, the predictability that you estimate uh, of the various messages in that hierarchy. So put it very simply, um, if there's any imbalance between the precision of your prior beliefs deep in the hierarchy, your convictions, this is how narratives unfold, and the precision afforded sensory information, sometimes referred to as sensory precision, then you can see immediately that there's going to be a profound change um, in the way that your sensorium causes you to change your mind and generate new and different hypotheses um, about what's going on. And if certain drugs selectively act upon the precision at various levels in the hierarchy, you can see how easy it would be to dissolve the precision of your of your deep central beliefs and start to entertain intermediate hypotheses where um, the most of the shape to your perceptual content is at, at, at a lower hierarchical level. So this would um, translate in terms of a preoccupation and, and an inability to attend away from the sensory aspects of, of, of your perception. Um, at the same time, you now have, because you've reduced the precision, the rigidity um, of your prior beliefs, you now have the possibility to explore um, different hypotheses. And certainly, if at the deepest levels of the hierarchy, there is this, there are these narratives that have the selfhood attached to them, sort of me as an agent, um, and an agent that sort of does this kind of thing. Those are the ones that are, that are going to be dissolved and allow you to reconfigure those. So it's, it's basically um, using drugs to understand hierarchical message passing in the brain in terms of the precision or the fidelity of the sensorium versus your prior beliefs and just redressing that balance transiently with, you know, with, with, um, with a drug um, uh, usually. Uh, the, because you've um, because you've done that once, you may discover hypotheses that you didn't previously had, or you may um, en- enable yourself to not be stuck in a rut because you've now seen there's another rut next door and another rut next door to that. So you can have long uh, w- you can have long lasting effects in psilocybin assisted therapy, particularly in um, terminal uh, terminal cancer care, you know, end of life care, where you know it is possible that you get stuck into a particular um, self model, a narrative that has all these self attributes that I am a dying person. Uh, I would expect to feel like this and to behave like this. And this is, you know, my prior beliefs are then realized through active inference. But there may be other ways of um, of living in, you know, in the last few glorious months of your life, which are not hypotheses that you have been able to access at this point. So sometimes you can, dis- you know, you can dissolve these prior constructs and just allow an exploration of a landscape of hypotheses simply by flattening the free energy gradients appropriately through 
changing the precision or you know, the the slope of the gradients that cause in neural dynamics. Um, physiologically, that is just basically by reducing the um, the gain or the sensitivity of particular neurons encoding certain things in a predictive coding framework. That would be prediction errors. These are exactly the effects of things like um, 5H2A um, drugs like psilocybin. And, uh, and in fact, nearly every um, psych um, uh, psychotropic um, um, or psychedelic drug or psychomimetic drug used in psychiatry and most in neurology are exactly these neuromodulatory drugs that, 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 that don't change the firing, they change the sensitivity of neuronal firing to inputs and thereby um, do this sort of gating, this precision gating or attentional selection uh, or attenuation uh, uh, role. Um, the, 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 that is exactly what we were uh, positing as the justification for having a selfhood in the first place, because that you know it's the top-down deployment of the attention that is the purpose of having these very high, deep constructs. Right. Yeah, and I think the when you use the free energy principle to think about how the organism operates, something I like about it is it suggests there's a real pragmatism in the approach. It deals with its existing niche, niche its existing models, and responds based on that. It's not like it has a god's eye view of what the optimal perfect strategy would be. And so because you're because it's very pragmatic in that way, it, I can imagine it accounts for why people can get stuck with models that are no longer serving them, you know, so for most of your life, the idea that death is should be avoided at all costs is a, is a good model. <clears throat> but then if you're faced with certain death, at that point, you know, that that piece of evidence is struggling to update your model, but actually, it'd be quite wise for you to update that model and, and embrace the certainty of your death. Yes. Um, and yeah, so it makes sense to me that it fits with with this whole scheme we've been talking about. Yes, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, you know, many many people do have to sort of um, grieve for that childlike uh, immortality when 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 they're, when they're facing death, and do so very gracefully. You know, thousands, hundreds, of millions of people around the world, you know, have to have to do that sort of uh, relearning and find that new Bayes optimal explanation for for their for the way that they're uh, living in their world. Uh, I just just want to um, that, that was an excellent point, and, and just just technically, um, it's I think important in terms from a sort of the point of view of a psychiatrist, or indeed as you know a, a therapist, or uh, uh, just somebody who who deals with other people. Um, so there's something called the complete class theorem, which is a mathematical way of saying what you just said, which says that for any given pair of um, cost functions and behaviors there are some prior beliefs that render that behavior Bayes optimal so what that is saying there is no optimal behavior there are only prior beliefs um which is you know um i think lets you off the hook in many respects there is no but you know mathematically it is mathematically provable there is no Bayes optimal behavior there are just a certain set of prior beliefs you bring to the table to explain your lived world. Um, you could argue that, of course, after a sufficient amount of time, um, those prior beliefs may not be fit for purpose for this lived world. I think that's a weak argument because, because of course, we're in charge of making that world. You know, even if, it, if I've got agoraphobia and I um, make my world uh, just my, 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 my house, um, that my prize are now perfectly fit to explain this world because I'm not the kind of creature that goes outside. Uh, now, you may not think that's terribly functional, but from the point of view of the complete class theory, and this is a beautiful illustration of complete, uh, you know, Bayes optimality in so-called pathology. And there are related arguments for depression as well, that, you know, it may actually, in the longer term, be, co be completely Bayes optimal and functional in terms of this sort of, you know, tautological existential um, uh, view of, of, of uh, the free energy principle. Uh, there are evolutionary arguments, at least, um, that appeal to the free energy principle to say why we are prone to depression and how s s depression has survived natural evolution and selection. So you know, I think it's a really important point when it comes to sort of thinking about the way that you make your mind up about the world and the way that I do, uh, you know, they'll be completely different and both of them will be base optimal for you and for me. <laughs>